Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Omna Sapan. Thank you for joining us. At one point, the Navajo Nation had the highest rate of COVID cases in the U.S., but when vaccines became available, the community quickly ramped up efforts to get shots to residents. Cronkite News health reporter Camila Williams takes us to Tuba City, Arizona, to show us how one healthcare group is working to further increase those vaccination rates. This is what we do. This is what we prepare for. This is what we trained for. But this is not what Joe Baca thought he was signing up for when he started working as a healthcare social worker for Tuba City Regional Healthcare. When COVID-19 was declared a pandemic in March 2020, Baca feared for his own health and that of his family. I think I had been overwhelmed and um, I felt like if I were to get sick, I'm not going to make it. Baca wasn't sure he could continue his job, but with encouragement from his fiance, he found a new passion for serving the community. She really, again, brought everything into perspective and reminded me of what I was capable of and what, why I went into the area I went into. Almost two years later, Baca is still finding a way to help. These days, by simply going down the street. Baca helps out at this mobile medical unit, greeting residents driving up for COVID vaccines, boosters, or flu shots. During the pandemic, the clinic has been a key way to provide COVID testing and vaccinations for the Navajo Nation. Two to four times a week, the clinic stops at various locations across the reservation, serving about 20 patients a day. During the height of the pandemic, those numbers were far higher. We went into the um, doing COVID tests out in the community, um, pretty much um, blitz where we were um, handling at least over a thousand. Um, visits at one time. Clarissa Begay is a referral coordinator for Tuba City Regional Healthcare. Begay said Facebook and Instagram posts help spread the word about vaccine availability. 58% of the Navajo Nation is fully vaccinated, according to the Navajo Department of Health. In all, over 39,000 tribal residents have contracted COVID-19 and over 1,500 have died. Valentina Nez knows how important it is to be vaccinated to help keep her, her family and friends and neighbors safe. It was scary because you just don't know who has COVID and you just want to protect yourself and you think about your family as well and then also your coworkers. We have so many elders, we have so many young children, we don't know what the effects are on them and we lose our elders and just even young people. So it's, it's a good thing. On Tuba City's Regional Health Medical Unit, they have adult primary care and child wellness. However, if you're coming here for another reason, like getting the COVID-19 and or your flu shot, you'll have to wait in your car. Begay says there will be a second mobile unit to reach more people and go out to schools to give children the vaccine. And the good thing with our mobile unit is um, us traveling to different communities, we can take it out to the community. And as the day comes to an end, those working at this mobile clinic know they have done their part to help protect this hard hit community from any more losses to COVID. In Tuba City, Camila Williams, Cronkite News. With a second mobile unit, Begay says there are plans to offer dental care and more vaccination drives are expected. The Phoenix Zoo is the latest in the United States to vaccinate animals considered susceptible to getting COVID-19 from close contact with people. Big cats such as tigers, jaguars, and African lions, many of the zoo's primates like orangutans and tiny emperor tamarins, as well as Egyptian fruit bats, armadillos, and two-toed sloths are among 75 animals to get their first shots. Staff members are now giving the second jabs to serve as boosters. The big cats were vaccinated from a distance with the use of darts. No Phoenix Zoo animals have been detected with COVID-19. The Beck family of Arizona is well known in the state's soccer world, from Hall of Fame dad to a son who is an MLS star turned social media sensation. Now another member is leaving her mark on the game. Cronkite News reporter Jaden Sormani has more on the Beck soccer legacy. Tim Beck has coached boys soccer at Ironwood High School in Peoria since 1993, five years before his daughter Haley was born. Now as Tim winds down his coaching career, 
Haley is just getting started. The former four-year varsity soccer star at Centennial is now coaching that same program, hoping to follow in her father's footsteps. It's definitely a tough last name to live up to in terms of my dad's legacy because even people in the district just know who he is from soccer. So it's definitely been a really cool thing. It does give me a little sense of, of pride, a little extra sense of pride that she's kind of doing similar things. I hope she makes that program at, at when it's her time her own and does it her own way. Tim is not only a 2016 inductee to the Arizona High School Athletic Coaches Hall of Fame, but also the National Soccer Coach of the Year for the 2018-19 season. Even with such an accomplished coaching career, the choice to play soccer was up to his kids. We certainly pushed on our kids at an early age. You're, you're going to be doing things. You're going to be doing sports, activities, something to keep you busy. Because, I mean, I've been teaching here a long time. I see the difference between kids who are involved and kids who aren't involved. So I said, you will be involved. Haley also had the desire to become a teacher, as her parents do which caused her to put soccer on pause. My dad was obviously always super supportive of all of our endeavors, so when I told him I didn't want to play in college, he was super okay with it. It's like I like paid my dues, I did my time. And now her time has come to pave her own path away from her father's shadow. I'm a boys coach at a school in the district, and that's kind of where the similarities should end. I told her, look, you don't have to fulfill a certain amount of championships or, a, you know, just do things your way. Both boys and girls soccer has begun in the Peoria Unified School District. And it is no secret that both Becks will have their sights set on championships. In Peoria, Jaden Sormani, Cronkite News. And now a look back at some of the top stories from the Cronkite Sports Bureau. The Sporter Roller Derby has been out of commission since the start of the pandemic. Cronkite News reporter Zachary Larson tells us how a star football player fell in love with the roller derby and how his family continues to drive his passion for the sport. Jordan Anderson is a star defensive player at Basha High School who has received offers from several colleges. Football wasn't his first love, but contact sports run in the family and his parents knew it would be a natural fit. My parents just kind of threw me in there to see like what I would do and I did really good my first year, so I just kept playing. Jordan's parents are both roller derby players. His mom, Avanya, at age 46, is one of the top 100 players in the world. His dad, Ron, also plays and coaches the sport. The aggressive nature of roller derby prepared Jordan well for the gridiron. He was at all of our roller derby games since he was little, so he saw what we were doing and how we were practicing, so I don't know if the, the aggression kind of transferred to him. My parents love me playing football because it's like they can be rough with me just at certain times and then I can take it because they play roller derby. While the three are used to the bumps and bruises of their respective sports, there's an added adjustment for Jordan's parents in their sport. Ron coaches his wife, which can create a unique dynamic on and off the track. Sometimes I have to tell her, watch your face, you know, I'm not your husband, I'm your coach, you know, I might say something and she'll roll her eyes and I'm like, I don't want the rest of the team rolling their eyes at me. And I feel like it was kind of a package deal. Like, <laughs> whenever I went to a team, you were going to get him regardless if he was a coach or not. With many leagues having not played since March of 2020, but the stoppage has allowed them to focus on their kids. And after skating for 15 years and being so deep into the sport of roller derby, you know, it kind of lifted a little weight off my shoulders this last year and a half of not having to worry about that, especially dealing with their schedules. The Andersons hope to roll into a rink again in the near future. But until then, they plan to be at every game supporting Jordan and helping take his game to the next level. In Chandler, Zachary Larson, Cronkite News. Basha High School finished at 10-0. They play in the first round of the Open Division playoffs on Friday against Liberty. Sports staples in the United States include football and baseball, while in Europe, soccer and darts are popular pastimes. Cronkite News reporter Ashlyn Register has more on how the local World Cup dart player and his partner are trying to bring the European passion of darts to their home country. Tucked in the back of a shopping closet in Gilbert sits Jester's Billiards. We uh, have a lot of pool tables, a lot of dart boards, foosball tables, uh, full service bar. It is also home to and a sponsor of one of America's top dart players, Chuck Puglio. Puglio has competed in one world championship, three World Cups, and is a multiple CDC Tour winner. 
but darts was not the path he ever thought he would take in life. Naturally, reality in life happens, and uh, you have to start working, and none of the sports naturally, you know, we can go pro in. Darts has taken him all over the world, from Arizona, Tampa, Philadelphia, and even all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Germany to compete in the World Cup. The biggest difference competing overseas is the passion fans have for darts. So that's the beauty over in Europe, you have walkout songs. Over here we don't do that, we, uh, it's different. So no crowds, crowds. It's in a room like this, so the sounds just reverberate off the, the walls and just lift you up. Dark tournaments in Europe are an event with everyone drinking, having fun, and even dressing up. You don't realize you're entertaining them. You know, that's why you're there. So you just do it, you, you, you have fun with them. Julio's partner, Danny Lauby Jr., wants to bring the love of darts and the fans' passion from Europe back to the United States. In the UK, Europe, um, they have like dart clubs and they can just throw darts after school and it's like a cool thing you grow up doing. And I tell my friends I play darts, they don't know what, what I'm talking about. But until the passion of darts hits America, Julio will continue improving his own in the back of Jester's. In Gilbert, Ashland Register, Cronkite News. Pulio is currently the fourth ranked dart thrower in the U.S. The next tournament is the CDC Tour Finals Championship, the Continental Cup. That will take place in New York on November 20th. The winner will qualify for the 2022 William Hill PDC World Darts Championship. Football, for many of us, is the first sport we associate with college athletics. But for Diné College, it's the rodeo program that's the star of the show. Cronkite News reporter Zachary Larson shows us how the program is a big part of the Navajo Nation's culture. It may feel like the middle of nowhere, but for those driving Route 66 in Northeast Arizona, Diné College is in just the right place, especially if you're into rodeo. And I just had a dream I wanted to be a bull rider so as soon as I woke up going to school I told my mom I want to ride bulls and she thought it was the craziest thing. And... For riders like Cody Jesus, rodeo riding comes naturally living on the Navajo Nation. Our native Navajo people were where our livelihood is with sheep, cattle, horses, were, were, for centuries were been brought up with that. Located among the red rocks and lightly traveled roads of the Navajo Nation is where you'll find Say Lee, home of Diné College. The small town and community college grew as more students found their way to the yellow coated rodeo arena. When Diné College opened more than 50 years ago, rodeo is part is a program that was embedded into the college. <laughs> Since its inception in 1968, the college has grown to over 1,500 students, and several of those students rode their way to the college national finals rodeo. Back in the day when the, the rodeo program used to be the program to, to be a part of, um, we used to have more than 30 plus students be part of the program. A once full team has dwindled down to four members as the pandemic has caused the rodeo gates to remain shut. Now we're trying to get one foot one and the other and start up, you know, to, to, to get going. And, and I just feel bad. I just felt bad for the kids that were here. Those students now have to watch the program start over after the virus shuttered school sports for over a year. But as rodeos begin to pick back up, their 23-year-old star, who's one of the top bull riders in the state, is excited to compete for Diné. Honestly, I've never been here. I've, I've seen pictures and stuff, and I always wanted to come out here. So when I was, you know, rolling up, what better place to practice at is what I thought. The Sawmill, Arizona native, chose Diné College to get an education, something the school hopes more athletes will take advantage of. I am pushing the academic side, making sure that the students come here to Dene College to receive a quality education. Not only is it about getting an education, the team hopes to rebuild the program through the passion of the Navajo community. You see little kids wearing their bull riding chaps and their bull riding vests, and I really think it means a lot to them because when I ride, 
anywhere like PBR World Finals, they come and they support. And It may take years to rebuild the program back to its glory days, but one day the trailer full of cattle will hit the dirt road and find the spirit of rodeo once again within the dusty landscape of Diné College. In Salee, Zachary Larson, Cronkite News. The rodeo program has lost out on many talented athletes after losing scholarship funding due to budget cuts in 2017. But new academic incentives have been put into place to help lure students back to the program. For the second year in a row, Phoenix Raceway is hosting the NASCAR Championship Cup Series race. Cronkite News reporter Ashlyn Register was on hand to talk to the final four drivers about the big race. The NASCAR Championship race weekend has made its way to the Valley. The final four drivers are ready and prepared to take it to the track to compete for the Bill France Cup. We'll hopefully make the right choices and, you know, kind of tune in what we feel like will be the best. You know, obviously we, we set the car up and left the shop with what we feel like is the best to go line up and race. I mean, that's, that's how, this is how we would line up and run the race if we didn't have any practice. I know, you know, Larson's won a lot of races, but I think across the board, it's every week. You just never really knew, know who was going to show up and who was going to show out. And we've seen a lot of guys really competitive that we haven't in the past. And I think we've seen a lot of guys that were, you know, really competitive in the past being consistent, you know, including us. After 35 races, it comes down to one final race. It's Hendrick versus Joe Gibbs, and who will take the checkered that's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. Next on Break It Down, we examine the myths and stigmas surrounding suicide and mental health. For tops Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.